medcram. Welcome to another medcram video. We're talking about the flu and specifically this is recorded in January of 2026. As you can see here in the United States, we have peaked in terms of influenza cases and specifically this is the influenza positive test results reported to the CDC. And if this trend continues, it'll show that influenza cases have peaked already in December and are on their way down. The question is, is why does this happen? In fact, this happens almost every single year, about one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year, we see the peaking or the maximal of these infectious diseases like influenza. We can see for those in Great Britain, in the UK, same sort of thing happening here. Again, this is from their websites. You can see that things have peaked in multiple age groups. And in the older age groups from 65 and above, there seems to be a little bit more of a lingering of influenza cases, at least in the UK. Hi, this is Dr. Roger Schwelt, board certified pulmonary critical care and sleep specialist, and also co founder of medcram.com, where we have multiple courses along with continuing medical education units, not only for healthcare providers, but also for lay people who are interested in medicine. And I wanted to make you aware of a new course called Health Optimization on our website. Not only do we have traditional medical courses like congestive heart failure, COPD, asthma, et cetera, but also on evidence-based medical interventions that can actually help your body that are non-pharmacological. So let's talk about the flu, which is a big issue currently right now. We've just peaked. And as you can see here, this happens every single year at around the same time, about one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year, usually around late December, early January, we see a peaking here of influenza deaths per week here in the United States. You'll see here influenza and pneumonia in orange going up and down, just like we showed here in the previous slides. In fact, not only do we see this kind of variation with influenza and pneumonia, but in fact, just about every single natural infectious and non-infectious cause of death. If we look at heart disease here, we see that the variation in heart disease between the summer and the winter is actually larger in terms of cardiac deaths than we see completely with influenza and pneumonia. In other words, during the flu season, we see more deaths from heart disease than we do from influenza and pneumonia. All of this correlates with timing of the year. This timing we see is very predictable. So the question comes up, what's exactly doing this? Is it the temperature? Is it the humidity? Is it the fact, as some people say that, well, there's a lot of gatherings this time of year, right? There is Christmas time and New Year's and a lot of parties. And that's the reason why we see these spikes in influenza. Well, interestingly, if we look in Australia, and I assume that they also celebrate Christmas and New Year's in Australia, you can see here that their flu season is exactly six months out of phase from where we are. Their flu season peaks one to three weeks after their shortest day of the year, which is in June. Notice here that Christmas time and New Year's in Australia leads to minimal influenza cases. And you might think, well, maybe this is related to the weather. Maybe this is related to temperature, the fact that it's cold. Well, let me show you here the temperature in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. In July, we're talking about a high of 64 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Not exactly bone chilling weather that you would get in the northeast of the United States. So this really can't be the reason. And if you look at cities that are very close to the equator or countries in this case, such as Singapore, you'll see that throughout multiple seasons, there's really no type of pattern. And that's because the sun doesn't leave Singapore for any period of time that's actually going to cause this type of situation. So not only do we see this for infectious diseases like influenza, but other infectious diseases such as COVID. So interestingly, this was published in January of 2021. When you look at the autumn in Europe of 2020, we know that in April, there was a huge surge in COVID-19 cases in Italy because that's where the initial pandemic started in Europe. But as it moved on into August, September, October, November, there was a surge in the autumn COVID surge dates. 
And when they looked to see whether or not it was temperature that explained that, you can see that the R squared correlative constant was 0.00. Same thing for humidity. These things really didn't have any effect whatsoever. What did have an effect, however, is when they looked at latitude, which of course is connected to sunlight. And you can see here that the surges in COVID-19 in the autumn of 2020 first started in Finland and went down the continent, ending in Greece. In fact, if we look at a graph that looks at the observed day of boost, in other words, the surge in which day of the year, so the 250th to 60th, etc., all the way up to 310, and you looked across the same type of numbers on the x-axis. Instead, though, you're looking here at what day of the year in that particular country does the amount of ultraviolet B radiation equal below 34% at the equator. You can see here that the correlative constant is 0 0.9. 9993. So this is an incredibly very steady highly correlative constant that holds up across Europe despite multiple different types of healthcare delivery systems, political systems, and infrastructure systems. And yet, when you simply look at the amount of light coming from the sun, there is a very clear relationship. So you might say that this might be related to weather or temperature. Well, even though I've already shown you that that's not the case, if we look at a study that was done at Harvard looking at the temperature and also sunlight, there's a very interesting study that was published by Slusky and Zeckhauser out of the Harvard Kennedy School. They actually looked at solar radiation data and they looked at the flu index from the CDC and they were able to look back particularly at the year of 2009. Why that was special was because that year we had a H1N1 pandemic in influenza. And what's interesting is that instead of coming at the usual time of year in November and December when it's cold, it actually came earlier in April, May, June, and through July when it was actually much warmer. So here we're able to actually bifurcate out the temperature aspect and to really look at sunlight and solar radiation data across the United States. And this is what they found. They found that sunlight strongly protected against getting influenza. Not only influenza, but we have data that was published showing the same sort of relationship as there was more solar radiation, both in the United States, England, and Italy. We saw a reduction in mortality from COVID-19, and this was independent of a vitamin D pathway, suggesting new possible COVID-19 therapies. We've talked a lot on this channel about the benefits of infrared light from the sun. We're going to be talking more about that in upcoming videos, so I hope you stay tuned. In fact, when we look across the world, I was actually able to team up with Margaret Scutch et al. and publish a paper showing that in countries where more than 50% of their population are overweight, there was a definite association between COVID mortality and also latitude. My recommendation is as we are starting to come down from the peak of influenza cases and deaths, not only in the United States, but around the world in the Northern Hemisphere, definitely would recommend getting sunlight, as I've talked about before. Another study that was published back in 1997 showing that if you do get influenza, you can significantly attenuate the symptomatology of that virus by simply taking NAC or N-acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams twice a day. In this study, they took it for six months. It was a total of 262 subjects. It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, multi-center, and they found that in those that took NAC and got the disease, there was only 25% symptomatology versus 79% in the placebo group. That's a tremendous absolute risk reduction. So this flu season, I want to make sure that you understood what was going on. I think probably the best way to protect yourself from getting the flu, in addition to doing all of the things that we normally recommend, including hand washing, flu shots, and the things that you've heard before, a couple of things that you may not have heard before is sunlight exposure, as we've shown here, and also N-acetylcysteine. And if you enjoyed that, please join us at medcram.com. We at Medcram emphasize some of the interventions that you may not readily hear about. People rarely talk about sunlight 
as being a benefit in terms of all-cause mortality, even though the evidence shows that this is the case. You rarely hear about people talking about these randomized controlled trials looking at something like N-acetylcysteine, which is over-the-counter, that can actually reduce symptomatology in something like the flu, something that kills tens of thousands of people here in the United States and also around the world. And we at medcram.com are on a mission not only to educate people not educated in medicine, but those healthcare providers that are educated in medicine and want to do a better job of educating their patients. We deal with evidence-based medicine. And if you're interested in that as well, support us. Go to medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.